from New York, New York, you are listening to Extra Time, driven by Continental Tire from the AT&T 5G Virtual Studios. I'm Andrew Weeby with my partners in soccer, David Goss, Matt Doyle, no Kalen Carr, drinking tea, recovering a little bit uh, from uh, what I hope was a great Father's Day weekend for all of you out there uh let's get into oh, it happy father's day weeby oh did did i say what something a coincidence. about whoa that's strange uh, I Doyle, do you have that. kids no. you don't no, have kids, I, you know what? I, I don't do, do either uh, of you guys have kids no i don't i don't have kids uh <laughs> we, don't, we don't have to do this i appreciate but it but i did have a father's day moment this weekend because for my birthday i live in new york city if no one's heard greatest city in the world but i'm not allowed to have propane or coals on my back porch always mm-hmm. i'll burn down the whole city knew i was meant to be a dad when i knew those rules back to front when i <laughs> yeah. lived in new york so for my birthday my girlfriend got me an electric stand-up grill nice so it works like a grill but it's electric and i was grill master on saturday morning or sunday morning one of the two i grilled breakfast it was delicious so you have the so, griddle that's what you're saying well griddle to grill either it, or I don't know. I, I don't know the specification well, I mean, right here. It calls itself bacon? a stand-up grill. Okay, you just. I'm saying. Are you? Did you cook eggs on this? Yeah. Contraption. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. got a griddle. It's, yeah, uh, yeah. Just. I'll help you out. I'll guide right. you through. These are the early I did days. Some for veggies. You. I did eggs. I oh. toasted my bread on it. Well it was done. Delicious. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. Um. Yeah. It was a wonderful you make, you weekend. Make chopped cheese. What? I mean, you, you, did you ever make a chopped cheese? Because like that's a that's the type of thing that a New Yorker would do, right? Yeah. So I love New York. It's the greatest city ever. There are things about New York. Chopped cheese is grody. I've had it a bunch of times (laughs) on a bunch of bodegas. I want to like it. Wait a minute. not good. Do you like chopped cheese? You've never had a chopped cheese. You have never never had had one. You tried to come at me. I I have had multiple ones. I would try another one if someone had a wreck. But I'll just say, from the bodegas around me, they are. Well, it's not a Brooklyn thing. No, no. in, In Harlem. Okay, yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's an He's a man of the boroughs. He's a man yeah, of the boroughs. Here, bro. They make me feel Come gross, on, too. Happy Father's Day, anyway. This has been a perfect return. It feels like we haven't had really what we want to have to sink our teeth into for like a month. Because MLS has been in a long break. We've had the U.S. national team, Canadian national team, CONCACAF, uh, you know, the Liga MX MLS All-Star game to push into. But we haven't had a full weekend, and we finally have one. On today's show, Verde Listos, Q2 Stadium opened up. With a draw, that wasn't the fun part, but uh, we'll talk through that and what Austin need to do to make the playoffs. Matt Turner for MVP. The campaign starts here, maybe, I guess. Raul Ruiz Diaz's revenge tour is ongoing. you got to call this up, man, for Peru. Otherwise, he's going to destroy MLS. Jacob Glessness goes deep. Crew Stadium, our favorite memories. Blanco, DK return, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, MLSsoccer.com right now. MLS and Juneteenth. If you did not see the jersey numbers, if you didn't get the story behind them, we had the interview with Israel Solomon last Thursday, and we talked to Mark McKenzie about what's going on in the U.S. and the world when it comes to racism and racial abuse. You know the story around him uh, with the U.S. national team. Plus, those jerseys will be auctioned, so look out for those. MLSsoccer.com and MLS Social. Doyle, you put Yeoman's work in every weekend on your wrap. Sam Jones talked Atlanta Philly. We had instant replay. Brian Shawcross did a thing, got a red card. Uh, We mostly agreed somewhat, so go check those out. But first, as if there wasn't enough to talk about, uh, just hit my inbox this morning. Just hit MLSsoccer.com. Uh, the headline is pretty clear. MLS to launch new professional league in 2022. I repeat, in case you didn't figure that one out. MLS to launch new professional league in 2022. It's basically connecting the developmental pathway. I am not going to lie. I don't know a ton about this right now. The release that has been put out, the information that's out, is a little bit uh, maybe not vague, but not complete, let's say. 20 clubs starting in 2022, that's like the firmest detail we have. Those are MLS clubs. There's the potential for independently owned teams to join for that inaugural season as well and ongoing. So, yeah, a new league in North America. It Damn. seems like a... It seems it's like a tradition, uh, and this one is <laughs> this one is one that I'm I'm looking forward to to figuring out with more depth. Let's classic put it golf way. guy and Weeby, a tradition like no other. Yeah. and then announcing a new league. Uh, it, it, there were still a ton of question marks, but I just think I know personally for someone who works in this industry, talking to players and coaches in this industry, more jobs is better for everyone. So mm. if you're adding 20 more teams to the professional landscape of soccer. In this country, you're adding more playing opportunities, more coaching opportunities, assistant coaching, operations, social media, everything these teams will need. And that's how you're going to grow the sport in this country as well as in Canada, because it sounds like Canada 
the Canadian clubs will be connected with this as well, where they don't have an opportunity right now in the USL championship. So, um, so it'll be interesting to see how it comes along, but I don't, I don't think there's ever a drawback of having more spots for more players to play in more places. And we've seen MLS next over the last 12 months, sort of step up and fill a void that was created because of COVID in the youth sphere. And I think this is the idea as well as how can we add to the development path? I don't think we're ever going to perfect it in this country. I just think it's too big of, of a region with too much going on. But I think if you can let less players fall through the cracks or give more safety nets for players who do fall through the cracks to then get picked up later on, we're always going to be better off. The safety net thing is, is really one of the things that kind of jumps out at me because in part of the, the discussions that I've seen, and I haven't gotten to go through the release, the fine tooth comb. Um, but like the idea is that there will be the, the, the sort of the top prospects from MLS teams, the guys who, who sign at 15 years old, who sign professional contracts, those guys will be in this team. And then there will be guys who, who maybe fringe MLS players who, you know, aren't breaking through on the game day roster um, or just like long-term pros who aren't on MLS contracts, but also guys who are maintaining their amateur status and are going to college for a year or two or even four they're going to be able to play um, on these teams as well. So it's, it's sort of a way of integrating all of it. And I know that USL has done a very good job with this um, as well. They're just not as built out in terms of, uh, you know, their, their academy structure and integration and all of that. So um, it does seem like a, it does seem like it, it is going to be a step forward for youth development as a whole. But like you said, David, like there's just no, Given how big the U.S. and Canada are, there's just no way to absolutely perfect it. But I think this will provide more opportunities for guys who would have fallen through the cracks otherwise to get out on the field and to, you know, to, to play professional soccer. And now, just one last real quick ad ahead. is we know with the 22 under 22 rule and all these things. Right now, it looks like a lot of times when you bring in a big name player from another country who is younger, they don't they're not totally prepared to carry an MLS team. Yeah. This is a chance to, to bring those players into the fold and get them minutes in a comfortable spot and bring them along where you're not, you know, specifically signing these guys to be a star at the MLS level, but you're bringing them to the U S like Atlanta did with Eric Lopez last year on Atlanta too. Uh, Red Bulls did it with uh, Christian Casares on Red Bulls too. There's like a bunch of examples of this. This is just more opportunity to do that. Cause again, so MLS is going to be a selling league. It's not just selling your own domestic products. It's selling young players from other countries as well. And I think this is a way for MLS in this region to be a feeder over to the rest of Europe. This feels a little bit to me, like in the current setup of things, kind of like North Texas. Yeah. yeah. Like that's going to be the approach for a lot of teams. Now they can't, not everybody can say we have Dallas's catchment area and the level of talent there or the track record or the connections with Bayern, et cetera. But that would seem to me like uh, a club you might look at and say, okay, this is what we're trying to replicate. Now, we said there's not that many details right now. That is very true. This is direct from the release here. Further details, including the league's name and logo, participating teams in the inaugural season, and the application process for expansion clubs will be unveiled over the course of this year. So, yeah, there's a lot of information to come here. We will keep you apprised of all uh, those developments. I, I well. think they should name it League Milan Plus. Did I say that right? Is that when you prep, your, you prep all your ingredients before you cook? I think that's the term. It's French. I shouldn't have stepped yeah, into that. Man one. doesn't yeah, know do. grill versus griddle, but he's trying to throw exactly. out French. Cook. <laughs> he's, exactly. he's like, I don't know. I, I put food on it. It came off cooked. It all worked for me. Listen, yeah. Doyle, I'm always counterclockwise, 45 degrees at perfect temperature to make sure my sauces are the proper thickness. Oh, you mean I you're thought gravy. You were... Steve yeah. fixed us. So Anders is away. H have fun, Anders, being away. And Steve is in the chat, and he said mise en place. Ah, that's helpful. Which I then probably pronounced incorrectly. Yeah, that's also helpful. Uh, there's also going to be sort of a parallel league office for this in New York, I believe. So to go to what you were saying, Dave, there is there's just more more opportunity, whether it be at the player level, the you know the operations level, people who just want to work in this industry. Uh, that's a very good thing because I know how hard it is. I, I hear from a lot of people saying, "How do I get in? How do I do this thing? How do I help grow the game?" I'm super passionate about it. Well. More opportunities means more chances to say, hey, go here, apply here. Here's a job that's there for you. So we're happy about that. Let's jump into the weekend, week eight. Seems like there's been so many more. It was so good to have it all back. And it was awesome to see Q2 Stadium open on Saturday night in Austin. I never get tired of new stadiums, and I don't think I ever will. 
I started covering this league, watching this league in an independent league baseball stadium, and it is a beautiful stadium, and Casey Woso play there now, and it's a wonderful place to see a game. Um, but we were doing interviews by urinals, and, and people were celebrating on a pitcher's mound. I mean, there were aspects of it that just weren't, um, you know, weren't up to where Sporting Park is, for instance. Weren't up to where Q2 Stadium is. What did you guys see in this game other than more Verde than the eye can see? I mean, it was, if you want like a green out, that's what this was, whether it be Matthew McConaughey's leisure suit. Is that what, we, is that what we're going to call that? Leisure I suit? Was, yeah, I don't think it was a full-on leisure suit, but it was definitely heading in that direction. I, I think we could call it that. What would take it to full leisure suit? Yeah, like it's got the, the big, the big lapels. Thing. It's got like the, you know, it's got the two, the two tone going on, like the the frilly shirt. Would that be? I that's what I have exposed in my head. Exposed chain over over yeah. like a really thick mat of chest hair. What do we What do we need for that to go full <laughs> leisure suit? I'll let you keep ideating. I'm gonna yeah. remove myself <laughs> from this. Discussion. Anyway, there was that. There was also an amazing tifo beforehand. Stevie Ray Vaughan. Uh, Matthew McConaughey, Roel Salinas, Barbara Jordan, Leslie Cochran, and Willie Nelson on that one. All legends, Austin, Texas legends, um, done by a local artist. It was beautiful. It was awesome. Uh, the result was nil-nil. That wasn't ideal. Most teams, when they open that stadium after a long break, they win their games. Only two have lost. So at least Austin didn't lose. But ultimately, that is not what they need to do to get Who to the playoffs. Who are the two that lost? Uh, Toronto FC Classic. and Cincinnati. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. <laughs> so, you know, TF- old TFC at BMO. For in sure. TFC. Pre-Danny Dickio's goal scoring for Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Um, so what do you think about the game overall, about the stadium, about the environment that uh, the supporters groups brought, and then about the result? Because ultimately for them, they need, they need to win at home. That's how they're going to get the playoffs. Go ahead, David. No, I would... I, I lean more towards the experience and the environment, which was the energy we talked with Jorge, I think it was, mm-hmm. last week. Jorge and Thomas, I was yep. and I was ready for that. And I felt that the whole time from home. And also, we haven't seen a ton of fans in stadiums over the last few months. And so you turn on MLS this weekend, and it was just like a shot of energy to feel it and feel the energy and feel the players connect to it. Um, and so that was that's what I walked away from. Yeah, the game wasn't beautiful and don't have a ton of thoughts about it. But the just the experience and the environment of watching that from home is like you got every one of us internally has a list of, oh, this game's being played here. I'll throw that on. Like you have your league pass teams, you have your entertaining teams, you have your entertaining environments. And this one already jumped up towards the top of the list. Yeah, I would agree with that Like in that you can with certain stadiums, you can tell like at a glance where the game's being played and like, you, you know what that crowd sounds like. And it looks to me based upon one game. So take it with a grain of salt that Q2 stadium is going to have that type of environment that is immediately identifiable and kind of draws you in, kind of makes you want to watch the game, whether or not it's a great game. Um, This weekend's game, it was not a great game, but I thought it was super entertaining for a scoreless draw. Uh, you know, both these teams play wide open and in different ways, right? With, with um, the Quakes, we know it's the man marking. In this instance, uh, Matias Almeida went away from the sort of 4-1, 4-1 or the 4-3-3 that he's liked to play and gone, and he went to more of a kind of a 3-4-2-1. Um, you know, he, he got rid of his wingers because his wingers – do not put the ball in the net and he went with a different formation. And so that made it look a little bit different. And then Josh Wolf is really committed to this four, three, three sort of positional play. And when it works, it looks great. But the thing with that type of ball, heavy dot ball, dominant positional play um, is that every turnover ends up being an adventure and it ends up putting a lot of, uh, a lot of stress on that back line, which right now isn't very good. And then a lot of stress on Brad Stuver, who right now is spectacular. He's, <laughs> He's spectacular. Like Brad Stuver it is, is arguably the goalkeeper of the year to this point in, in this season. Like he has been amazing. And we saw it again in this one late when he had that spectacular save on Fierro. And then um, I think two others down the stretch. So like, it, it ended up being like a wide open entertaining game that just absolutely crystallized what we knew about these teams going into the season. We said for the quakes, it's like if their wingers aren't scoring, then they're going to be reliant on a 38 year old and a 17 year old to put the ball in the net. And that's it. 
That, that's still true. Like, it's only Wando or Cade Kyle. They have no other attacking answers. And with Austin, we looked at their forward core of Denny Hewson, uh, John Gallagher, and, and Aaron Schoenfeld, and we said that's not going to be good enough. And Hewson is completely out of the mix at this point. Schoenfeld's been hurt all year. Gallagher's a, a nice player, but they actually moved him – Josh Wolf moved him to, to the left wing, and they have Cecilio Dominguez playing as kind of a false nine. And Which that is tells your DP you. DP winger. Yeah. And that tells you everything you need to know about their attack. And these two teams combined, um, San Jose have one goal and zero wins in their last five games, and uh, Austin have two goals and zero wins in their last six. They need, like, both these teams need attacking help. Um, can I go on a sidebar here? Cause you mentioned Brad Stuver and I, I weirdly was watching Seattle LA and thought about this with Jonathan bond. Who's been great. Yep. I think LA did a good job to go out and get him is how many expansion teams have come in, pulled a quote unquote backup from another team. Who's been a starting it's now what Stuver, Joe Willis and Tyler Miller Miller three years in a row. Well, Miller was a starter with LAFC. No, and but Willis, LAFC Will- pulled him from Seattle That's where fair, he wasn't yeah. a starter. And yeah. Willis was a starter with Houston, but fair. Yeah. But it's just how many teams are now still going out and getting international goalkeepers when it's yeah, like, no, it's fair. It, it's not a guarantee those guys that everyone's a starter, but it feels like there's enough talent in U S and Canada to find at those positions. And your so, cost sorry. benefit roster spot analysis, you would think would tell you don't use an international spot, find a guy who's in league, but, but yeah, oh, what are you going to do? Penn how about Austin? gets two teams. <laughs> Kendrick Ramirez gets two teams, and that goal he gave up against Jonathan Lewis oh, was cool. Man. We, we will get to that in a, in a little bit here. Let's try to plot this out for Austin because they want to make the playoffs. Um, that, that's the whole goal here for them. That's what they've been set up to do. And maybe they'll go out this summer and make the signings they need to get goal dangerous. But I did some research here. I think that about 45 points is the bare minimum that you are going to need to make the playoffs in MLS 2021. 45. That's the bare minimum. You probably need 48 ish to feel really safe in that spot. They've got nine from nine games. And if you look at the history of teams that went on long road trips to start the season to open a new building, like six plus games, the history is pretty positive. Like Sporting Kansas City back in 2011, they got 33 from 51. Houston did it a year later. They got 39 from 51. Even like the Portland Timbers got 28 from 51 in in 2019 when they were reopening. Can they get the points needed to do this? Is this a playoff team as currently constructed? And and would they be if they got a, a goal scorer? I mean, it's not that easy. You don't just snap your fingers and have Raul Ruiz Diaz walk in in the summer. I don't think they're a playoff team if they just go out and get a goal scorer. I, I, I you know, they they obviously that would help um, turning a couple of these draws into you know, into three points. That is that would be a big step forward, and you know, maybe things will snap into place for them. Um, over the the final two thirds of the season, now that they have so many games at home and they're not going to have to adjust their entire schedule week after week after week, like they were doing on that road trip. Um, but they just, they play so open right now and every turnover is a real adventure and they don't have the type of center backs that put out fires in transition. And all of it is ending up on Stuber, all of it. And he has been up to the task. He has been wonderful thus far in in 2021 but like i i i would be surprised if he could keep playing like you know prime buffon out there like he he has been like he has had to be that good let me let me start you with also so they go midweek this week they actually travel to minnesota they then come home they host columbus portland and lafc in seattle the next four at home yikes so it's not like oh you roll home and get results um you then go into that July, August period where everyone basically has a midweek game, which is a crapshoot for a lot of these teams with the depth they have. And I'd say Austin isn't one of those teams that has a high level of depth to cover for those moments. So I think we're going to know a lot in the next five or six weeks of if th- this team can punch above their weight. Now, all these ties, sometimes a home environment is what is that half bit that gets you off a, a 0 one one to a 2-1 win, right? We've seen that in MLS, I think, in the past is that environment, that, yeah. that energy especially the home environment, which is it's going to be 110 degrees D- for all DC these games. Uni- DC United 2018 is exactly. a perfect example right. of that. Yeah. So, so, so I think all that potential exists, um, but it, it's going to be tough, and I think we're going to know fairly soon. Yeah, right now it doesn't feel to me like this is just sort of a foregone conclusion. Like, oh, yeah, we're home. We're going to turn it on. 
maybe not the personnel, maybe not the momentum, maybe still trying to figure themselves out, but a big weekend for Austin. Q2 looks amazing. It was amazing for the U.S. women to open it up. It was amazing for Austin. And this one, from the TIFO to the songs, I, I do like Verde Listos. I think it's a good a good sort of easy rallying cry for a stadium, and sometimes you need to have those. Uh, and everything they did with the band. I mean, look, Jorge told us we're going to have from 20 to 50 instruments every game. And sometimes I felt like it was it was like truly a song. It's like a composition that they're putting on out there. Uh, and I hope to see more of it. So, I wandered into some, I don't know, live video post game show that some fan group did in one of the bars. And everyone had a hoarse voice. So I thought they did a good <laughs> That's job. That's a good there. sign. That's a good yeah. sign for them. Uh, let's talk about a, a stadium that closed its doors. We didn't give this enough. They just didn't give it enough juice, I don't think. And we're here to give it that juice. It's our Celebrating Soccer, uh, driven by Connell Tire, moment of the weekend. It's the final game at Crew Stadium. And it's a Dosa Cerro victory. And it's a goodbye to a building that got the soccer-specific stadium movement started in the U.S. And then captivated our attention, despite being extremely ordinary. I'm just going <laughs> to say it. Like, this is not a beautiful building. It's not a state-of-the-art, incredible place to go watch a game where you look around and you just say, wow, cutting edge everywhere it was uncle an emotional Lamar's, place uncle lamar's erector set that's what yeah it was. <laughs> but like in that in that erector set the decades of emotion of historic moments of fates on a knife edge whether it be in mls or in, in Concacaf and qualifying or it otherwise was, yeah it was proof of what we had all said which was well, if you put a, a soccer game in a soccer environment, it'll be awesome, right? And it was always this, we were always having this, well, there's only 25,000 at Giant Stadium, but if you put it in a normal 25,000 person stadium, it'll be great. And you didn't actually have proof of that until Crew Stadium. And so I know growing up not in the Midwest, I would watch games there, similar to what I said about Q2. You wanted to watch games from there to see the environment and to feel that like soccer could exist. And then my first trip there was for World Cup qualifying against Mexico. And it was like, that was the Mecca I had to make. The Hajj that I had to go on, sorry, to the Mecca as a U.S. soccer fan was I want to be there for a USA-Mexico qualifier. And when I went, it lived up to everything I wanted it to be. Uh, and it was like a long trip for me to get there and everything. And it's one of the best experiences I've ever had. And every time I've been to Crew Stadium since, it, it's lived up to that. ML it was my first ever MLS Cup as a fan. Um, and it was amazing. Obviously, they didn't win, but still epic watching Timbers Army's people fall out of the stands yeah. <laughs> into the sec into the field after they won. And just like the energy around it, I'd never been in a sold out MLS stadium before. I don't think um, I'd been to big games at Gillette and at um, wow. Giant, Giant stadium, stadium. Yeah. but not, you know, not full technically. And so that was like a, a changing moment for me in the way I viewed everything, the way I thought things could be. So it was really sad to see it go, but it's also, was awesome to see how the fans connected with that moment and celebrated it and made it what they wanted it to be. I mean, the muddy parking lots, the tailgating, uh, just the feeling of of that pre pre U.S. Mexico environment. Like I just don't in Columbus. It's a little bit cold. You're all out. You know, you're trying to stay warm in the parking lot. You're just waiting for game time. It seems like it's never going to come. You have fans mingling. You have all these hopes. Like. I mean, that, that's all stuff that I will always remember. And I'm trying the to think wind, of my, the wind. Any <laughs> playoff <laughs> game wind. was negative five. <laughs> but I, I, they mentioned it on the broadcast and, and they put together some really great videos, um, the, the, the crew in Columbus about it. And they talked about, to me, one of the greatest MLS games I've ever been around was at Eastern Conference against Toronto in 2017. And everyone thought Toronto was going to walk to it. And then people Higuain plays out of his mind and Miram was good and all those things. And that environment is one of my favorite games of all time and the energy around that. And that's what Crew Stadium could bring, right? It didn't feel like they were in the series. And you walked in the building, you were like, oh, Crew are going to win this. And it was like the first time that had crossed my mind. And then they ended up actually winning the game, but not the series. Um, but it's those moments when, when it gets cold and the lights are on at Crew Stadium that were always epic. I always enjoyed the Nordeca just in general, but their treatment of Guillermo Berchelotto, who's one of my favorite players in this league's history. I mean, just the bowing down to him and that entire visual and the idea to do it uh, and the celebration of that player and his place in their club's history, that was always uh, incredible to me. I think I was at two U.S.-Mexico games. I was definitely there in 2013 uh, where it was the Dos Acero with a penalty miss to hold it at <laughs> Dos Acero. And Thank then you, we, were there, we were there for Mexico's win. Uh, the 2-1 win sort of in the I mean, – it was a very strange game from a 
just sort of a like a, a social and political perspective at the time because of the elections and all the dynamics were there and there was the moment of unity and I remember US scoring the goal I think to get back to 1-1 Dave mm-hmm. and we'd had a great time in the parking lot and we're all just like basically falling down sta- steps on top of each other just like ah! <laughs> it just uh, it's just a place that will have a lot of different uh special moments for me that I'll never forget that were sort of formative ones as you said in, in my in my time as a, a U.S. and North American soccer fan. And what uh, before, better way to send it out than Dab God himself, Derek Etienne Jr. Well, da, you know, Jossie gets <laughs> two. Yeah. Do you have a favorite memory at Crew Stadium, Doyle, or a, a mean, time that... Like La Fria, the, the, the first Dosa Zero back in, back in 2001. Uh, it was, I think, the first game of the hexagonal. Um, Crew Stadium was not quite brand new, but it was very, very new. And it was, um, you know, the U.S., were on the come up. Uh, it was still Mexico's region, but the U.S. this new generation with guys like not just Donovan and Beasley, but uh, Mathis and Josh Wolf and a few others. Uh, you know, they they were not afraid of Mexico, and uh, they went out there in early February, and uh, the U.S. had a couple injuries to key players, Claudio Reyna and, and Brian McBride, both had to be subbed off, if I recall correctly. And and Wolf and Mathis came on, and uh, Mathis hit the still the best pass in U.S. soccer history. That that like left footed forty yard through ball, you know, kind of over the top to to Wolf in stride for the first goal. Uh, it was just absolutely spectacular, and um, the. You know, I think it was Ernie Stewart who got the second goal. And like that was in a lot of ways, that's the game that that started the legend of, of Crew Stadium. And it's one of the biggest wins in U.S. men's national team history as well. And it's kind of not remembered as that, but it, it should be because it did signify for at least a decade the sort of the the changing of the tides in terms of who was on top in, in the region. So that and then. I mean, last year's MLS Cup was that. I mean, that performance from the crew was the most dominant MLS Cup win we have ever seen. Um, and the way not just Zellerion played, though he was amazing, but Harrison Awful, who is arguably the best right back in MLS history, um, Aiden Morris having the performance he did and what that means for the homegrown initiative and play your kids and all that. That, like, I'm I am not a crew fan, but they made me like by the middle of the second half, I was rooting for the crew in that game because of the aesthetics of the game and like the implications of that performance. So those two are the ones that are always going to stick with me. And that said, I can't wait for the new stadium to open up because it looks so much better. And I think it's probably going to block the wind a little bit better, which means they'll be able to, you know, the games won't be quite as as helter skelter as they could really get in in historic crew stadium. A wonderful place. um, And a wonderful goodbye from crew players and their fans. I can't help falling in love with crew. I think Do that's they what really they were say saying. That? I think so that's what they were saying. My sources tell me that in the manuals that have ever been printed up, it is lyric that way, but most of the time it sounds like you. That's, that's what a, my sources say. No, that's a good middle ground. I like that middle ground. Either way, the uh, the communal sort of uh, choir moment at the end with everybody, and the place was still packed. If you look around and the, the, camera, the camera goes and shows you sort of the totality of the people who stayed and all the, the players and the uh, their families and the coaching staff and ownership. I mean, it was a wonderful moment to send it out, but lower.com field, as you said, Doyle is coming. We look forward to that. And the crew are starting to play better. So three straight wins for them. Yep. Kevin Molino off the bench. Yeah, that, that'll work for them. That'll do. Um, we'll dig into that more, but I think that's a good, a good way to turn the page to a team that maybe doesn't want to remember some things and wants to lean on the history. That's the Chicago Fire. The big news with the fire outside of losing again, I mean, that that seems like sort of old news at this point, is they have a new crest, a new look. It dropped last week, new colors, uh, the traditional Chicago flag colors. You got the big C with the star in the middle. You have the blue on the outside. Uh, This is a huge upgrade (laughs) over what what they're currently wearing. And it was a, a good process for them, I think, to reconnect with their fans and try to understand what Chicago fire fans and supporters were saying, this is what represents us. This is what we want. This is Chicago. 
I think they hit it. What do you guys think about this new crest? I think it's I dope. Yeah. I, I like I I still love the original fire crest, but Same. I under I understand like if you talk to Chicago fans, they'll be like, I I wear a fire cap around town and people ask me if i'm in the fire department and it's just it's like and, and like that's part of what makes the crest great that original crest great but it's also like i totally understand why from a marketing perspective they felt that they needed to change that and they got it wrong the first time and nothing but credit to ownership for saying okay we we did get it wrong and we're going to listen to the fans and we're going to take their input and we're going to um, come up with a new crest that sort of reflects both the fan input and the culture and the symbols of the city. And that's, to me, that's what they hit with, uh, with this new crest. It, it, it just looks spectacular. It's instantly one of the best in the league. Also piece of advice, any MLS executives or fans out there that are thinking about this, should hit up Matt Wolf the first time, <laughs> not the second time, and then you only have to do it once. Yeah, seems like that's a trend. Yeah. Huh? The I, secondary, I, the secondary of the GC, yeah. the like little crest, mm-hmm. that thing's epic. Put that on anything, and I will wear it. I, I think awesome. that's a that's a big change because they're the what the, what they're doing now. Again, they they're saying it's wrong. We're saying it's wrong. It's not identifiable in any way to me. And there's not much about that crest, if anything, that I'd say. Hey, put that on something. I want to rep that. Whereas I think any way they go about sort of executing on this new crest, these new colors, is just going to say Chicago. And it's going to say it in a different way than any of the other professional sports teams there, other than the Red Stars who have had this, right? Yep. So, you know, you had a good example to follow in that sense. So you're saying you'll rep anything Chicago, right? As I long mean, as it represents Chicago. I'm Andrew not saying Reedy's I would. I'm not saying fan. I would, but I would think Chicago folks would be more right. apt to. So, it just, so anything that you put it on, exactly. it'll, be, it'll speak Kansas Chicago City, and Weeby will wear Kansas City, it. New York City, Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. Chicago, I'm a man of the people. I represent mm-hmm. everything, all right? Okay. But it's good stuff. What about on the field, though? What Oof. about on the field? Do we have a quick take here, Doyle? Do you want to just sum up what you said in your column? I mean, I don't know that there's they a ton of four goals. nuance. They four goals this season. Like it, Which it, we it, didn't think would be the problem. Yeah. We thought the problem would be stopping things on the other end, which has which been a problem. Which is still the problem, yeah. Also the problem. But that's the part that hurts to me is, like, I've said this, I think, two, three weeks in the season, like, if you're going to lose games, make it look pretty. They have a couple midfielders that like to get on the ball, and they can. And as Wikis tried to save things, everything they did well has gone down the drain. And now you don't know what the center fo- point is. And when you look at this roster, every move was made two years ago, and most of them were on two-year deals. And now it feels like you're running out the clock to basically reset everything again this offseason. And, and Sorry, like, Doyle. And, that was your, no, I was supposed to let you. No, know. that's funny. You, you, I think that... You made good points, and I, I will say that of all those moves, the only one that feels like it worked out was for Barrich. Yeah. But Barrich hasn't done anything this year. Um, you know, he has struggled, though. I think in large part that's due to not getting the type of service that he needs. But, like, it it feels like they're headed to another sort of reboot ahead of 2022. All right, Chicago Fire fans, got your new crest. Let us know anything about the stuff on the field. Joshua Norgard hit us up, and he wasn't uh, so happy about it. So that's why we tackled it for you, Josh. Hey, Revs win. You called this maybe the best game of the season, Doyle. Yeah. 3-2 against NYCFC at Red Bull Arena. You know, credit to you if you got fooled by the boards. I was still thinking Yankee Stadium, and I was like, yes, Tommy Max, score at Yankee Stadium again. You need game winners from you. Um, But, yeah, this was like the Matt Turner show. This was a clash of two really good teams in the East. One that's getting the results and the points, and the other that's sort of been left begging and thinking, hey, we deserve a little bit more. Yeah, and NYCFC for most of the year has been playing sort of a 3-5-2 or sometimes a 3-4-2-1. In this game, because of the, you know, Alex Collins is missing, um, and because of the return of a bunch of their their midfielders, it was much more of a 4-2-3-1, which is, I think, what they want to play um, going forward and they just look so smooth in it. They were able to get all over the ball and pull the revs apart um, and create chance after chance, whether it was, you know, via transition opportunities or, you know, building from possession. Um, They just look so smooth and so good uh, getting into the box and creating high level chances. And I mean, it was just Matt Turner, the difference (laughs) with Matt Turner. You know, he, he, he's the best goalkeeper in the league and he has been basically since he 
was a starter in, in 2018. Um, I tweeted this out and I wrote it in my column and I'll say it here, he is the best shot stopper I've ever seen in MLS. Um, like he, he, he is absolutely spectacular. And, um, you know, if you watch the, the little compilation of his saves from this game that I, I put into my column, um, if you look at the underlying numbers, go to, uh, American soccer analysis.com. Um, those guys are, are working on some cutting edge stuff to, um, to try to do a better job of using numbers to explain the game. <laughs> like Turner is just head and shoulders above, um, what even the best goalkeepers in history have been able to do. And he was the difference in this game. I did the math on this. And it's basically how many goals is he keeping out that expected goals model would allow in for American soccer analysis since he started playing in what was he got the starting job from Brad Friedel in 2018. Yeah. And he's at over that course of, of time, like more than 22 goals. And this was before this weekend. So now I imagine it's probably like 23 or 24 because <laughs> the save on Tati Castellanos period, that was like a, one expected goals. I mean, those don't exist. But wasn't that one off? Or there was, was a handball so after he saved oh, it off of his hand, it. and then he was there to make the block on the he, other he, side. He, he was ready on the double save. It was this was the like an arm out save. stretch from no time, reading it and getting yeah. it, making the PK also look extremely easy. But he had prevented 22, now again, it's probably 23 or 24 goals that the expected goals model would have expected. And there were only like eight or nine guys who were in the positives, and the only one close and he wasn't even close at 13 with Steph Fry. Everybody else, all the – Andre Blake wasn't in the positives. Sean Johnson's down at, like, the three wow. expected goals prevented. I mean, he, his underlying numbers are – it's honestly absurd in comparison to the rest of the league. So it truly I, I, is. I will say Andre Blake had a couple tough years in 17 and 18. But that's the consistency or, side, too. Right. And Andre Blake was awesome last year, and he's been awesome – Again, this year, you mentioned uh, Bond for the Galaxy. He's been awesome. Stuver has been great. Um, but yeah, the consistency thing is what has has made Turner, like he doesn't give up soft goals and, and he makes a spectacular saves. And we were having this conversation, Weeby, before the show. We, it's kind of a meme, like, oh, imagine if our best athletes played soccer. Matt Turner, if he had played baseball, would be like, a power hitting corner outfielder or third baseman or something. If he had played basketball, he would be like a, a sniper of a, of a combo guard. If he had played football, he would probably be like an elite slot receiver. He is just like that level of an athlete. And I, for whatever reason, I don't think that the, the typical fan really appreciates that. Um, and maybe it's because he's just a goalkeeper. So you, you can't, it's not as easy to see it if he would be, uh, if he was a, a field player, but like, I, there are not many goalkeepers who are worth the price of admission. Matt Turner's worth the price of admission. He, he's just absurd. Here's the question from uh, Sunday afternoon fullbacks it says uh, Matt Turner is going to be the first goalkeeper to win MLS MVP since the great Tony Miola. This is no. sort of a meme, but it's not. <laughs> How could, is it possible? Andre Blake couldn't do it. I can't, you know, there's been the some... only way it happens. And I don't want this to happen is that the Revs win Supporter Shield and Carlos Heel gets hurt. Yeah. Because if they win Supporter Shield and it's not super obvious and Buxa doesn't blow, you know, explode or... Yeah, and Bo and no, Buxa are like... No attacking players seasons, dominant. Each, right, and Heel yeah. doesn't play the full complement of games. That's the only world in which it's possible. And on top of that, Turner probably has to be great in the Gold Cup and start in World Cup qualifying to get at least the, like, media flow going in his yeah. direction. It won't happen. Yeah, you crushed that one pretty convincingly. Sorry. Can I, pretty can I throw out, because you guys mentioned absurd. One of the most absurd moments of this game was Sean Johnson direct goal kick to a let for um, Tati Castellanos at midfield, which ran through for Medina to create the penalty kick. Awesome. That That's should awesome. the pass of the year should be Tati letting that run from midfield. It was absurd, and then Turner saved it, so no one will ever watch it again. And the pass that decided the game went from Carlos Heel to Tejon to Tommy Mack. I mean, a beautiful through ball from Heel. Uh, Revs at the top of the Eastern Conference. NYCC trying to pick up points where they think they should because they're winning expected goals battles a lot. Had a PK saved in this as well. Jay Cooper hit a sub Doyle. When will NYCFC stop winning just expected goals and start winning actual games? Next Where's your thought. snapshot on they'll them be, right now? They'll be fine. They'll be when fine. They stop they playing of, against Matt Turner. <laughs> yeah, they'll be one of the – if they play like this against almost any other team, it's a multi-goal win. Um, and I, I thought Tiago Andrade 
the the one of the young Brazilians they signed. Yeah, he got a goal. Take. Like, that was a really nice goal. Um, he looked like he looked like a significant player. Um, and you know, Maxi is back healthy. Jesus Medina is playing really good soccer. Tinner home was back healthy. He struggled in this one, I thought, but I, my money is on Tinner home figuring it out. They're still thin in, uh, in central defense. That is, that is a worry. Sean Johnson has not been up to his previous standard this year. That, that Bogle, is that Bogle. Yeah. I mean, it, how are you going to put that on him? It's I'm a not laser it on, from I'm not behind two him. defenders that bounces in front of him. Yeah, it's hard. I'm just saying. I, it took I'm a little not... deflection, but I, I I would want my goalkeeper to save that. Okay. Um, but I, I I think this team is about to to go on a like check back six weeks from now if they're not top three in the Eastern Conference. I will be shocked. Magno got the start in this one as well. I don't think you mentioned he, he, that one. Yeah, he didn't look good. No, but he, he looks like he and it, he you know he wasn't super aggressive, but it does look like he feels comfortable swapping in and out of the center forward spot which will allow Tati to float and kind of find the game as he wants to. So that could be successful, interesting for them going forward. Uh, how about uh, Seattle Sounders there atop the Supporters' Shield? 21 points. New England are on 20. Wait, it's it's okay. Anders isn't here today. Yeah, yeah right, because let's let's go. Go. Let's yeah, but, look, they, but they played the Galaxy. So. Oh, so See, now you're bringing yeah, it back in. Okay, so cool. it's got, you know, it's all Acceptable. It's full circle. The decision makers that be here at Extra Time, you know we're talking about those two. The numbers back it up. The underlying Man, expected, how did we even get that Jimmy Hendricks Yeah, the, the expected <laughs> mentions are really high on Seattle and L.A. <laughs> very, very high. Uh, 2-1 win for Seattle. They kind of grinded it out. Um, you wrote, and I think I think it was a good uh, good observation, when Greg Vanny confirmed, is that L.A. wanted the ball, and that was their best way to defend. It almost worked, but Raul Rudiaz is Raul Rudiaz, so it didn't work. Um, Seattle hasn't conceded a goal from open play. Shua Hinkle hit us up, and then we went back and checked it. That's pretty incredible, just for this year. Yeah. This and without is, Ariaga this week, he's down in Copa America. Yeah, this is a Supporters' Shield winning team sort of victory. You're not at your best. Yeah. You don't have the best performance, and in the end, you have three points, and you just keep it rolling. Yep. And And – the fact that they've been able to do this all year without Nico Ladero, who is now out until probably August. Yeah. Um, Steph Fry the, in the same zone. Yep. Steph Fry in the same zone. Stefan, uh, is it Stefan or Stefan Cleveland? Stefan. Stefan Cleveland. Yeah. Um, he has been very good filling in for Steph Fry. He made a, a couple of very nice saves in this one. If you play in a mid major, you're not allowed to be Stefan. That's the rule. <laughs> <laughs> what is he, I like don't know. Cleveland's- like, unless you're drafted, so, or are we just saying that? Because unless you're name. drafted by the Red no, Bulls, and then uh, you can Stuber be Stefan. Went to Cleveland State, yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> um, but they, like, he may be a Maryland guy. May it's just, a, it's just a, a really well put together roster. Um, and Brian Schmetzer has pulled basically all the right levers in, in getting them to play as a unit. I, I do worry a, a little bit that they're kind of drying up from open play. They need to, to be a little bit more incisive than we've seen the last three or four games from them. Uh, might have to do with the amount of energy expenditure that they're getting from uh, from Christian Roldan. Like he, he, that dude makes more sprints per game than, than I think anybody, I certainly anybody in the league now. But like it's not it's, Daniel Shallowy. No, right. that's yeah. runs per game. That's oh that, runs. No, it's not the, but but Daniel Shallowy is a very <laughs> prolific runner. Nice. There you go. Um, but I, I think part of it is they're not necessarily grabbing a hold of the game in central midfield as much as they were earlier in the season and. That goes back to Vanny's point. <laughs> he played four tens in this game. He played Kleschen and uh, Legette. Victor Vasquez. Uh, Kleschen and Legette deep, Victor Vasquez, um, and then Efra coming in off the the right. Uh, and he said, like, the, the whole point was we, we are, we're going to go down swinging with the ball. And, I, like, I love the fact that, they, that he tried to do that. Um, and, you know, Seattle didn't create much from open play, so credit to credit to you know credit to Greg Vanny for that. But as you said, we be this is a we're winning the supporter shield type of win because they just found a way to get those set piece goals and they didn't give the Galaxy much to look at from open play themselves, and um, that's a pretty solid pretty solid blueprint. You got the uh, whistle in your mouth. Uh, Chicharito takes just a little bit of contact that he initiates from Jao Paulo. Gets a little theatrical with it's it. It's from behind in the box. Yeah, it's a pen. It's, I'm fine with it. That's 10 yeah. out of 10. Okay. That's a pen. Uh, yeah. 10 out of 10, I'm not sure about. But Ooh, I'll give you, I'll give you eight and a half out of 10. 
Different eight scales. Different it's, scales it, there's contact sure. there. It's never going to get reversed. I uh, had to ask, though. For the Galaxy, it was good that Sega Koulibaly got in. Um, his first start since he's come over, and I think the, the defensive midfielder as well is pretty close. And then Stara's got hurt, and Depew came in, who I struggled. Depew. Yeah, he struggled on the ball when he came in, but why is why is Stara's the starter? Like, I still, maybe it's different when Derek Williams comes back, and, and that's just something that's happening, but it feels like the LA Galaxy defense has been poor for five years and Stare has been the one mainstay and everyone else needs to get changed. So it's been interesting. Jorge Villafania was very good in this one as well because Victor Vasquez doesn't really cover a ton of ground in front of him. <laughs> um, so he had a good game as well. You don't say. You don't ask Victor to do that. Come on now. Yeah. He's he's the one cooking it up. He doesn't serve the food too. Uh, Jakub Glesnes again. Oof. Again. Getting a point for Philly in Atlanta. Uh, again, to go back to what you were saying about environments, Dave, looks like an incredible Incredible game day environment in Atlanta. It's so awesome to see all that back. But Jakob Glessens, he's just saying, I'm going to take it. You're going to be the space over and over. I'm going to smash this. I'm going to hit the crossbar literally three times. We were amazed when a ball hit the, the two posts and went out on a PK. This hit the crossbar flush three times bouncing up and down. I think, I think Guzan tried to save it twice, even though it was already in off the first yeah, one. He's just out here <laughs> flailing. Between that and the LAFC one, which was a free kick, which was better? This. I think this one. Oh yeah, yeah. open play. I was, ho- I was hoping somebody would it? say the other one so that I no. could just absolutely smoke you. I mean, not the, at the, all. the free kick was awesome because of the the way that ball moved and bent late, um, and, and like ended up going side netting. But this was a laser beam to the upper ninety that, as you said, Weeby hit it like smack the the crossbar so hard it bounced down, back up, hit the crossbar again, down, back up, hit the crossbar again. I have never seen I've that. I've never seen anything like I've that. I've never seen that. And the, that and it came in in second the 93rd half stoppage. Minute? Yeah, yeah down second half stoppage one. time, down 2-1. Like, in, in a, two teams that don't like each other because was, of what happened in CCL. It was Dame Time-esque. I think was. that's the only way you can describe it. It was a bad shot. Wait a minute. Did you just confirm Dame to the 76ers for Ben no, Simmons. Is that why go, you made a, He's a going Dame to the reference? Knicks, dude. Everyone knows oh, that. Yeah. He wants okay. to be in New York. It's a true basketball city. Uh, but you mentioned it, Weeby. Atlanta changed up the way they played. They basically man-marked once Philly crossed midfield, chased everywhere, and you have that one center back who has to play off, which means on the other team, you have a center back who will be free, and Glessness strode into that space for 30 minutes and kept trying to play passes and cut it back. And what we saw when San Jose does this is it's uncomfortable for other teams. I think it took about six months for other teams to then come into the game with a game plan of, Oh, our center back will be comfortable and confident knowing that's their space to take and they can hurt them when they do it. Uh, and we've seen Seattle, I think do it the best since that time. I don't know if Atlanta will ever do this again, but it took Jacob Glessness like 30 minutes to figure it out. And then he was like, Oh, okay, cool. So this is like training now. So I'm just going to hit shots from everywhere. And then he finally hit that one. And it was an Epic moment for them. Atlanta should have been out, right? They were up 2-0 at home, and Guzan makes a mistake, lets in a sh- that goal 60 seconds after the second goal, and that changed the entire complexion of this game. Otherwise, Atlanta walks away two or three zero winners, um, and, and that's a big moment for this team that's been struggling. By the way, are they? is there like a power shot competition at the All-Star Skills Challenge? I don't think so, but I mean, there is a crossbar competition, and given his ability to hit it three times in one go, <laughs> he should probably be the one stepping up to do this thing. Like, Zinyak's, everybody Zinyak's else going to be like, who is this yeah, guy? Everybody else go backspin. Everybody else get a little chip up to it. Glesnas is just going to actual just blast it straight through. Uh, all right, let's keep it rolling here. We'll talk about Atlanta more in a little bit because we're going to rank the concern in both conferences at the very end of all this. How about uh, Sebastian Blanco? We talked about people being back, whether it's DK or others or Molino. Sebastian Blanco returned for the Portland Timbers. They weathered a storm from Sporty Kansas City in the second half of this one at home, got a 2-1 win. Uh, what do you take away from the Timbers side quickly? And then we got to talk Gianluca Busio because there is a ton of news swirling around him regarding a possible transfer or likely transfer. I don't know. It depends on who you believe this summer. I mean, Portland had to juggle CCL and a ton of injuries, and they're still juggling injuries. As you said, Sebastian Blanco was back, but it's not like he started. Um, They're on 1.5 points per game. They got a really good 2-1 win. Yeah, granted, it was at home, and they bunkered in the second half, but this team could not bunker last year. Anytime they put defenders behind the ball and tried to see out a result, they were not able to do it. So doing it in this situation as they're starting to get – 
you know, healthy again. Loris Mabiala was back for the final few minutes of this one as well. Um, they're fine. And if they are able to get everyone healthy, they're going to be better than fine. They are going to be one of the, the you know, the three best teams in the, in the Western conference. Uh, so, you know, it, it's about to get, it's been pretty good so far for the Timbers. It's about to get better than that. Sporting KC had to be a little disappointed, but. Well, Doyle's going through puberty with John Luca Busio right now, so they're both they're both going through <laughs> some, it. some voice cracks. Uh, uh, but the one thing I'd say about Portland to, to Doyle's point is like we knew it was going to be a question mark till they got healthy, and they they're above water, right? They're where they need to be. Um, Yimi Chara and Felipe Mora as well at Copa America, so they're still dealing with a ton of this, and they're still getting results, which is huge. Here is uh, the quote from a recent Sporting KC long form. Uh, about John Luca Busio in his summer, quote, Sporting KC and Busio are working through the framework of a transfer that's increasingly likely to incur, uh, to occur this summer. They've been, they've been setting this up for years, like talking about it, setting numbers. They're out here saying we want at least $5 million. To me, there's a lot of negotiation going on in the public sphere right now for Sporting Kansas City. And to me, it sounds like, though they say they've had offers or... I think Sean Goodwin wrote this piece in, for the Star that there are um, sources tell him that there are offers, aka the team is telling him that there are offers for him that don't quite match up yet, whether it be in total number or sell on or in destination to where Gianluca Busio wants to go, which seems like Serie A because of his passport situation. Um, that's what but it could be. Any it could be, yeah. So Swulo is the team that has been thrown out there this morning. From where and why, I don't know. I just saw the name floating around. Tommy so Scoops had Sporting Lisbon last week, right? Did he? Don't yeah. call it Sporting Lisbon. Sorry. Sporting what do you want me? Uh, sporting Club okay. de Portugal. Sporting Lisbon is a construct of the English media. Oh. Like the UK media. Oh, uh, you know yeah. what? That Portuguese... I'm 1,000% on your side. <laughs> Portuguese don't like it when you call it Sporting Lisbon. Should I call them <laughs> Sports Lisbon? <laughs> Lisbon? Is that, oh. is, that your, is that your EG? There's uh, no, yeah, there's right no there. accent that is more jarring than be hearing people speak Portuguese. Uh, that was, that's about as uh, accurate a, a trot off of uh, the topic as we've ever done right Listen, there. Listen, I speak it as well as, as uh, yeah. Goosins, so I'm can, uh, right now. can you tell me what the odds you guys think are that this happens this summer? It, it sounds like both sides want it to happen this summer, should the destination and the price hit. And John Cabusio just keeps looking better every week. I think. Yeah, I think it's really high, especially if he's with the national team, um, because that's just that little extra exposure. Not that a lot of these teams need it, but I think it's a value buy for a lot of these teams with something that you believe will have sell on. And right now, where you look at where the market's at for a lot of these clubs on the lower sides of you're talking about Syria, maybe France, maybe Germany, maybe in Portugal. That makes sense to make a move like this. And I think Casey learned the lesson from Eric Palmer Brown, right? It's been the opposite. That one was they held him too long. This is they are singing from the rooftops that he's ready to go for the last two years when it hasn't actually been true. So now it is true. I think the interest will be there. I think the interest in American players like him is there as well. I think there's a lot of clubs out there that are looking at it and saying, how can we get the next one? of the Weston McKinney's of the Brendan Aronson's because we see the value that they are able to increase in what you're getting them at. So I think it makes a ton of sense for it to be done this summer, um, especially as the world sort of reopens up. I would, I would be keeping an eye on the Syria clubs with American ownership. And there's a bunch of them now. So that's, that's, and I don't know whether it's going to happen this summer. What I would, what I suspect is that the deal gets done this summer, but then he doesn't go until January, the, the the Brendan Aronson type of thing. And they specifically said this is something that, that could interest him. He said, yeah, I could be open to that. That could be interesting because right now Sporting Kansas City are second. They're trying to sort of get back to their, their trophy ways. And maybe he could be a part of that. Maybe it'd be a perfect story for them. Get as some long silverware, as Jorge Mendez is his on. agent, he's good. <laughs> we shall see. We shall see what happens <laughs> with John Lugabusio. Can I also throw out there that Jalen Unzi had a banger in this game? Talking about great uh, defender goals. The young right back went like upper corner to start the goal scoring got a little tougher from there espria got away from him on a set piece scored and then it bounced off him he does something not on set pieces in the run of play where he locks in on his player when balls go over the top rather than the ball and he plays the man which isn't bad all the time but he does it constantly and he gets beat a lot to that first ball because he's focused on the battle with the attacking player and when it's dire and espria it's sort of a tough battle to win 
Yeah. And Dyron has been amazing this year, by the way. He has been really, really good. Somebody told him it was the playoffs <laughs> game one. <laughs> DCL. He's been playing like it. Oh, man. They just gave him a different schedule than everybody else. He's like, yeah. yes, all year? That's He's really like, strange, oh, man. wow, MLS is really getting yeah, after him. Yeah, really, really jumped the shark on this one, all right? Uh, best coast bias result of the weekend, which means we're not going to either coast. We're going to stay in the middle somewhere, and it's the Colorado Rapids. They're third mm-hmm. in the Western Conference. Beat FC Cincinnati. They're averaging two points per game. Uh, and Nico Rivera hit us up. He is my buddy in Denver. You said we had an email from from Denver. We went. We grew up in Wichita together. We're great friends in college. He's been so broken a couple times. Nico, why did he just come to the show over a little over uh, a year no, he's ago? Listening. He sends me. He sends me all his notes on the show. Now what he says, he's literally <laughs> really? said came a little over wow. a year ago. Wow, didn't even read the email. So yeah. read the email here, and he I'll said, learn some more. And this year, I can honestly say I've never heard you boys speak about the Rapids for more than 30 seconds on a show. I thought it was interesting he called us that. Now it makes more sense since he knows you. He said, in parentheses, rightly so, being the team was filling the uh, bad pseudonym for Rapids, if you add the C on uh, earlier. Yeah. I, mean, they were, I know they they're a smaller market. Yeah, he said, I know they're a smaller market team, but I feel like they get no love. I'd love to hear Doyle, Lord of Data and Analytics, give his views on the teams based on the numbers. We're seeing third in the West, solid coach, scoring regularly, healthy squad, and some young talent. What's the ceiling for the club this year? being that the Pids don't have a Vela or a big name, take the team on your back type player. What can we expect from this group? Can they be a sleeper? I think they're, they're a sleeper, but I, I don't, I don't think this is a team that, that can compete for trophies. I think this is a 55 points type of team, maybe like what uh, the union were in, in 2018 or 2019. Um I mean, they're good. They play really good soccer. They've they've shown some flexibility in, in this game. They played sort of a five three two and said, you know, since he's going to try to hold the ball and they're going to bring their back line up and we'll get we could just hit them over the top repeatedly and that's how they created the first goal and then they that's kind of how they created the second goal as well. They're a really well coached team. They have some good pieces that I think we all like quite a bit. Um, uh, I had them, I think, fifth in the West in my preseason predictions. Maybe a little bit higher than that. Maybe they can end up third. I don't. I, I don't think this is a. I don't think this is a trophy winning team. This the the one thing I'd add is one with that ball over the top. It's fun when Diego Rubio gets to drop in and play. Like he's loving life in that moment where he's like, "Oh, I can be the ten. I'll come here and then Bassett right. and, and and Barrios can run." But the other thing is with this group, there hasn't been a ton of opportunity, but in big moment must win games. They have never played at their level yet. Yeah. So going into the playoffs, because there's not really going to be a ton of opportunity to prove that when you look at last year's playoffs, the run down the stretch last year, MLS is back. All of those moments, they are going to have to prove that they can be a playoff team. They're not a group you look at and say, Oh, they'll probably get hot and go on a run because they've never stepped up in those moments before. Should we be having the same discussions about Cole Bassett that we just had about John Luca Busio? Yeah, I think so. I think yeah. absolutely we should. His, what so his ceiling is different because I think he's not the same positionally as Busio. And how many people are bringing Americans in to play roles like that? Wait a minute. With Busio, we're talking about he, at this point, he's either an eight or a six, right? We've He wears the 10, but we're pretty sure he's right. not that. Okay. Right. And no matter what, even if he's not going to play a six, when you bring him in, the potential exists. And I think mm-hmm. that gives team's an idea of well he's worth it because he can play wherever we need him to where with Bassett you have to give him a level of trust which is he's going to be a key cog of our attack going forward and we just haven't seen that that much for young American players in that role even with Brendan Aronson doing it for Salzburg so I think that's that's the tough part with with the where will he go and when will it happen Um, and I think he needs to do something for the national team this summer to, to kind of push that along. We'll you think he'll be on time. that roster? Because I would I, put him on it. So <laughs> I I love Cole Bassett. I love what I, I've seen from him. I think his best role is the role that Demir Krylock is playing right now for RSL, where he's basically a second forward who occasionally drops back and helps the midfield not get overwhelmed with numbers, but then is – you know, making those those devastating secondary runs to finish in the box. He's not a guy who you play through as a number eight. Um, and in Greg Berhalter's system, is, you you have to you have to play through your eight. Is right? Weston that guy? No, 
and that's okay. that's but like that's a long term concern I have about about Weston. I would say like Cole Bassett and Weston McKinney, their their strengths are are pretty similar, and that it's, yeah. it's about those box those box arriving runs. Um, I I like Cole Bassett a lot. It's it'll I think he's one of the players who was really damaged by the U twenty World Cup being canceled and by the U S not making the Olympics, because I think if, if he was able to get some reps in what would presumably be Burhalter system in age group competition, I would be much more confident in his ability to, to push into the actual discussion for the U S national team. Um, but he's a, the kid's a talent the kids, a so, legit talent. So two things to add in one would have been cool if we had a goal scoring midfielder at the Olympic qualifying would have helped score goals. A couple of those just so uh, hanging out. The other is, and, and we have plenty of time this summer to talk national team. So I'm not getting too deep. I don't know how we watched what just happened for three games when Tyler wasn't in. And we look at this team and say, it's going to be the same setup if Tyler's not healthy or available. So I, I think we have to stop being in love with the, the formation we've seen most of the time. Because I, that was my, my big takeaway wasn't, oh, Jackson Yule's not good enough or Kellen Acosta's not good enough or can this guy step in? My big take is no one can do what Tyler does. So it has to be tweaked when he is unavailable, not if, because of the way qualifying is and just the way Tyler's body has proven to be so far. We have a lot of U.S. national team in the mailbag, so let's try to get to it here. The East Coast topic that we're not going to dig into here came from Mark Fishkin, the legend. Uh, New York passing the eye test as a uh, – wait for it, a playoff team. Looking increasingly so, like that's Extended where they're going to the be. the Fabio loan at the exact right time. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> Get the banger right after. They're fifth in the Eastern Conference right now, but we'll talk about them in a different way here. I want you guys to rank the level of concern that you have for these non-playoff teams right now. In the Eastern Conference, who wants the East? Raise your hand. Nobody? I'm giving it to you, Doyle. Yes. I didn't Toronto know F- Yeah. Toronto FC, Nashville, <laughs> Inter-Miami, and Atlanta. Who should be the most concerned by their oh, slow it, start? This, it, it was... Toronto FC, Nashville, Inter Miami, and Atlanta. Oh, Inter, Inter Miami, Inter Miami is exploding or imploding, which, whichever one. They're they're, they're being destroyed. Um, <laughs> they are not a good team. Uh, they got played off the field by DC United this weekend by they, Andy Nahar well, specifically. Well, also they played themselves <laughs> off the field a couple they times. Played too. Themselves <laughs> off the field. Their best two times. Player. Two times they played themselves off the field with red cards. Gregory is their best player and he got a red card and then Shawcross got a late red card. Um even with their first choice defense out there, they're all chaos merchants. You know, Shawcross, <laughs> LGP, Figal, um like th- this there is nobody who's like, okay, this guy's gonna steady the back line. Um Blasmo Tweedy has been he looks cooked. He just looks cooked. And he he basically has for a year now. Who uh, who was the play? And I saw, I mean, I didn't watch this full game. I saw this on like Instagram or Twitter. Who cooked literally the entire Miami team? Andy Nahar. That was oh, Andy that was Nahar? Nahar? Oh, yeah. God. That makes it even better. Andy Nahar, Andy Nahar looked like Danny Alves on that play. It was, <laughs> it was, it was ridiculous. Um, and and <laughs> Gonzalo Higuain missed this game for um, fitness reasons as per – as as per a, a Miami spokesperson, um, which was tweeted out by I believe Michelle Kaufman, um, who, who covers a team down there. Yeah, because uh, Gonzalo's. Yeah. I mean, you can't smoke and play. Come on. Yeah, man. he uh, like, Jimmy Nielsen might, <laughs> might prove you wrong. On that. <laughs> the break was two weeks, and he lost so much fitness within two weeks that he couldn't play against against a, a, a league, you know, an Eastern He's just getting ready rival. for midsummer and, and, and two games player. every seven days, Doyle. He's getting ready for those midweek grinders in the summer. It's. Doyle, it's, let me take you into like, the interpretation of like this. He's angling for a trade to San Jose alongside yeah. Rodolfo Pizarro. There you go. I like that one. <laughs> I, I, I like you. It's not fair to give that list and put, Miami on that list because when we're talking about concern, Miami b- belongs in like the Cincy and Chicago tier. They don't belong with the Toronto, Nashville, and Atlanta tier. So would Toronto be two on this list of most concerned? No, lost to Tor- Orlando this weekend. They have yeah, to- Orlando's really really good. Um, I I am more concerned about Atlanta. No, of the three. I am I am least concerned about Toronto because they have Pozuelo, they have Io, 
they'll, they'll have Soteldo back in a bit. Oh, so um, looks good in this one again. Osorio looks good. Like they have enough talent to brute force a bunch of wins, um, even if their defense is falling apart. And right now the defense is falling apart. Um, Nashville don't have that kind of talent. Nashville are the opposite of that. And, um, you know, Atlanta, Atlanta United, despite having the, the most expensive roster in the league, um, I don't think they have enough talent either. Um, I don't, I, I know MLS is a legitimately competitive league and everyone's going against each other. I just think it's okay for someone to call up Omar Gonzalez and is like, Hey man, this guy, Dallas DK is worth a lot. If you could not hack him on every single play, <laughs> we'd all love for that to be a reality. Uh, Omar ended up worse off for it, which sucks for him. Uh, and I hope he's feeling okay, but man, DK walked on the field and Omar was like, this is not the English championship. It's worse. And just through the back <laughs> every single time. It was rough. Yeah, you got, you got gentle treatment at Barnsley compared to what we're <laughs> doing right sure. now. For uh, sure. And Daryl created the goal, by the way. Mm -hmm. Just his presence created that space for the one-two for Urso uh, to score. It helps that Marky Delgado didn't track. Uh, but his presence was felt immediately when he got on the field. Not that we were talking about Orlando, because I don't think anyone's worried about Orlando. How about the Orlando's Western... really good. Yeah. Orlando's really, yeah. really good. How about the Western uh, Conference? Dude? So we for have, the I've, West, I've got Dallas, I've got LAFC, I've got the Vancouver Whitecaps, and Minnesota United. Who ha who would you be most concerned about? In terms of getting momentum to make the playoffs, it has to be Vancouver. And I, I feel bad saying that because I kind of was came with the year saying until they get back to Canada, it's a bit of a mulligan if they can keep their head above water. But it just feels so soul sucking what's happened to them over the last few weeks. And there doesn't feel to be like answers. Now Cavallini didn't start in this game. And I think Cavallini and Brian white up top as a two putting Dahomey and Kaiseido back in their more comfortable positions on the wing could make this team more dangerous and more effective. Um, but right now it, it doesn't feel like anyone's even looking for answers. And I know the fan base, we have emails asking about what's going on. Like there, there, there is not a ton of love right now there. So while these other three teams I think are in trouble and have issues, it doesn't feel like Vancouver has a fix to get out of theirs where the other sides you think either health players coming back or even the pieces they have being played in different ways could get them over the top. By the way, San Jose I, actually gonna... would have been my other one, by the way. Go ahead. No, I, I think San, I think San Jose is over. I mean, LAFC, we've had this conversation 50 times, but the talent's still there and the quality is still there. Whatever the performances have been and Minnesota and Dallas, I think as well. Uh, even though they haven't figured it out. I think San Jose has more question marks that they don't have answers for on their roster than those other three teams. Yeah, I'm not sure I agree with that on, on San Jose, but I, I'm not sure I disagree either. Only because Dallas might be worse off right now. Da like yeah. Dallas are, they can't defend anymore, which was always their, their saving grace. Um, and uh, look, man, you have to do better with your, with your imports. Yeah. You, you just, you just have to it, it, like Frank O'Hara has been a bust. R Ricarte has a nice eye for a pass, but he doesn't do anything else. He doesn't drive the ball forward off the dribble and he doesn't win the ball back and he's not goal dangerous. Um, it, you know, Brian Acosta, I think has had some good performances this year, but you know, just good. Um, and, and the, the new D mid, they just got Quinn Yon. Look what, look what he did on that. I mean, Ja'Cory Hayes absolutely just, like, stripped Pants him and him. broke him down. Yeah. yeah. That's, like, like, that's my ball, and you're going to watch the back of me run down the field, and we're going to score a goal. It doesn't – It their signings have not made sense, and they have not been productive. Um, and so all of it is falling on the homegrowns to rescue it. And Ryan Hollingshead, who I should mention – like, Ryan Hollingshead is – one of the two or three best fullbacks in the league. Probably Gold Cup Palim roster, justice for Ryan Hollingshead. Yes, yes. He is the best left back in MLS. He is versatile. Put him on a preliminary roster. At yeah. least. Um, but it's, He's it's, not worse than Donovan Pines and Robbie Robinson right now. <laughs> Sorry. It's, it's, it's falling to, to, to Ryan's Holl Ryan Hollingshead and, and the homegrowns to rescue it yet again. But now Lucci's not really playing the homegrowns as much. Uh, maybe that changes with Pepe getting the goal and, and Pomacall being healthy enough to start. But like, how is Tanner Tesman not starting in that central midfield? He's just better than the other options. Um, so I think Dallas is in a lot of trouble with LAFC. I, I put him in the same group as NYCFC. Like 
they're playing good soccer. If they keep play like playing like this, the wins will come. Um, the thing is, though, cu- heading into the season, we thought they were going to be a, a supporter shield contention type of team, and they're clearly not. Yeah, the difference yeah. between them and everybody else is everybody else just wants to make the playoffs. LAFC, if they're not in a position to make a real run in the playoffs, that and then don't do it. There's just a difference in expectations based on it's investment. It's a little stale, right? It, yeah. it, it looks like it, it's weird I, to say this, but like they, they needed to to maybe sell one of Rossi or, or Atuesta to, to like inject a little bit of new life in the team. And like those are two of their three best players. So it's weird to say should have sold those guys, but it kind of feels like that. And Latif being benched is interesting as well. Brian Rodriguez coming back. Almeria did not get promoted as well, unless he gets sold. But I'm not sure what he did. Nice, a nice long run in the Copa America with Uruguay would probably help. Yeah, that would help. I don't, yeah. Praying for that one right now. All right, let's get the mailbag and get out of here. 401 MLS. Extra time at MLSsoccer.com. You threw out that preliminary roster for the Gold Cup, Dave. We got those 60 names. Josie Althador was on it. I wrote recently that I would uh, – I would like to see Greg Berhalter, even if things are not worked out with Toronto FC, which they increasingly look like they might not be, on the Gold Cup if Josie is healthy, which he was. He was he was playing. They just got in an argument. Um, would you bring him? Do, would you want to see him on this roster? Let me just give you my logic. My logic would be that anybody that you have on that roster that's a fringe forward are is going to have to bust the odds to get to a level that could impact the U.S. national team in the way that Josie Altador, if he also busted the odds as it, as it comes to his club situation and his body over time, could be for the U.S. in 2022 and in World Cup qualifying. And if the point is that we got to get to the World Cup by any means necessary, don't you keep open the option that if on form, if healthy, lots of ifs, this player could be your best number nine option. Why don't you yeah. keep that in play? You have to keep that in play. I, I, I think we've moved past that. Josie just hasn't looked like that guy for two years now. And his, um, you know, his, his body, like he can't stay healthy for 90 minutes when, when he's been on what the if field. You, what if you don't care about 90 minutes? So I don't think we're in a position where you, you can say we don't care about 90 minutes. Um, now, maybe that changes for World Cup qualifying. Maybe Daryl DK, Josie Zardes, Josh Sargent, maybe they all fail. And we get that desperate, but Josie's got to play his way into it. And and he hasn't um, for a couple of years now. The last time he looked really good was down the stretch in 2019. And then he got injured and he came back and he scored that goal in the 2019 MLS cup. Um, and that was a like, geez, even when this guy is injured, he's still so good. He has not been that player for almost two years now. It just hasn't. And I don't think he's going to play a lot of minutes for Toronto FC, even with, even if things were great between him and Chris Armas, like he's not as good as Iowa Akinola. It's not. Um, so I like this summer, Jossie scoring is Jossie. Daryl DK, if he's still in MLS and not in Europe trying to, to win a job, it's Daryl DK. Um, and that's what we will see at the Gold Cup. And if DK is gone, maybe bring Matthew Hoppy in. You know, maybe try one of the other young, like Mason Toy has been awesome this year. Let's maybe see Mason Toy. Mason Toy has been hurt, though. True, but when he hasn't been hurt, he has been awesome. Yeah. So so I just think, like, you know, fitness. That's that's definitely the logical side. I will grant you that. I'm more in the fantasy universe side no, but where I don't somehow think... you get him to Mexico or he gets in a good club situation, and now you have this incredible wild card that can impact games more than any of those guys you just mentioned. But also, I don't even think it's fantasy to say if he is not on a club team, right? If TFC is not training with him, why wouldn't you bring him to some capacity? I'm sure you could bring him and have him with the group and not be on the roster. Do the, like, Nations if League you don't want... DK Exactly. Yeah. Why would you not have him around one playing soccer? And I think it's been... We've we've shown over the last two, three years that guys who aren't getting club time or aren't even with the club have been given an ability to play with the national team to kind of help them figure it out. It's worked for Matt Miazga for how long now, right? He was playing consistently with the U.S. while he couldn't get you know on the field with his club. And that keeps him relevant or puts you back into the eyes of people. Miazga so had a, Miazga had a bunch of super productive. Yeah. Players. Okay. There have been other players. That was the first one that came yeah, to yeah. mind. I apologize if that. If there are other people who have not been playing with their clubs that we've been bringing in. I mean, we brought Tim Way in. He wasn't playing with PSG. 
right? And he was starting yeah, I, for the I'll, U.S. I'm just, for that and year. I'm just saying keep the keep the candle lit. I I completely agree with you. And if he is good enough, then it's great. And when you look at World Cup qualifying and all these games, if you look at the course of three games and you say, if I can get 100 minutes out of Josie, that's one start for 60 minutes and then two appearances off the bench for 20 minutes to change the pace of the game. If I need it, then I think that that's a role that he fits into. Yeah, I think it could be interesting. Uh, anything quick clo- before we get Let me close here? this out on one email from uh, a Gabe who starts out with, I work for Louisville City, so I know I'm a little biased. He is one of the senior developers of business or something. I forgot the title now, but thanks, Gabe. He says, what are your thoughts on Jonathan Gomez as a USMNT prospect? He obviously hasn't committed to the U.S. at senior level yet. One of the four left backs in the Gold Cup preliminary group. The only USL player on the list. Super dangerous as an attacking wing back. Dreaming of a future where Richards and McKenzie solidify their spots with Brooks for a three center back system with Jogo and Dest as wing backs. Yeah, man. Gabe Gabe is doing some dreaming for sure. Yeah, I like you call him a Gabe as if there's a bunch of different Gabes to choose from here. I don't know much about Jonathan Gonzo- uh, Jonathan uh, Gomez. Excuse me. Anybody have the scouting report that they can? Yeah, hand off? really good attacking left back. He is an FC Dallas product. He was a North Texas player as well and then chose to go to Louisville. Seems like it makes his path to Europe easier in his mind. His brother is at FC Porto's uh, uh, reserves and left Dallas as well for that. So he he was a guy I know Lucci was high on and, and they felt like he would be a good player in MLS for Dallas and then eventually moving on and, and chose this route instead. And he's been starting all year. This is his first year as a starter. He scored a goal, I think, this weekend as well and is super dangerous going forward question marks defensively but i don't think there's a young defender that you wouldn't say that about so i was excited to see him in this pool i would be more excited about kevin paredes at left back dc united yeah i think that's because because kevin paredes is an animal like he he has a julian arajo thing where it's like you are you are not going to to get past him and i like that a lot whereas gomez is i mean you can you can watch the clips He's struggling to defend at the USL level. But Paredes got in the box this week. Gomez would have scored that. Paredes didn't. So just put <laughs> it right, up. There you go. There's your end of extra time into the weeds scouting report. Uh, thanks to you guys for hanging out, talking soccer. And thanks, everybody, for listening. We have a big one coming up on Thursday. Colin Martin and Robbie Rogers as part of uh, Pride Month, but as a, also just part of having conversations that we need to have. Charlie and I talked to them last week. We'll air that interview. It is extremely impactful. Um, I will say that... Um, I walked away with a couple moments of deep, deep regret and some shame. And I think uh, there's some introspection that we can all do. So I invite you to listen to that interview and do so with an open mind and open heart. In the meantime, have a great week. We will see you on Thursday. Did you enjoy that? Was that right up your alley? Well, go subscribe to Extra Time wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also check the full shows on the MLS YouTube channel right over here. And you can subscribe to the MLS channel right here. Thanks for listening and watching, everybody.